Hi everyone, this is Jim from Ease Seating Systems. The goal of this podcast is to provide information and resources on health, wellness, and rehabilitation. As an occupational therapist, I'm passionate about educating people on these topics, so it's my hope that you'll find some of our content helpful. Please support our podcast by liking, sharing, and subscribing. Thank you. I'm an occupational therapist, and you know, a lot of people have heard of physical therapy, but that occupational therapy might be a little less known um, if you're not in the healthcare field. So uh, just to give uh, a once over of what occupational therapy is, um, when you think of the word occupation, you know, uh, a lot of people think of a job, um, mm-hmm. a job that you do either, you know, for money most of the time. Um, and I think occupational therapy or occupations are jobs. However, that it goes much wider than, you know, jobs that you do to get paid. It could be jobs that you need to do as part of your day. So um, self-care routines, home management, um, paying the bills, it could be going to work. Um, And it's also made up of things that you want to do. So leisure activities, um, exercise routines, even looking at different roles. So caregiving roles, being a parent, um, occupations can mean a lot of different things, but it's really any job that you need or want to do as part of your day that makes you feel like you. Um, and that makes you feel like you are productive and you have, um, you're living a meaningful life. So it's, it's very broad, I think. Um, and occupational therapists can work with kids all the way up into older adults. So we cover the entire lifespan. Um, and it could be that we're working with somebody after an injury. So that's typically where uh, the setting that I work in. So I work in a, primarily a hospital setting. So somebody who's recently had a stroke or a spinal cord injury or a brain injury might come see a team of rehab professionals. So occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech language pathology, and we're helping them return to those valued occupations or jobs that they want to do or they need to do. Um, whereas some people work with kids, you know, from birth uh, all the way into school and beyond. Um, and it might not be coming back from an injury. It could be something um, that they're that they're born with, you know, um, or a condition that doesn't necessarily come from a traumatic event. So it really just depends on what the person needs and wants to do, and where we where, where we can help them participate more. And we're pretty holistic, so we're looking at you know, the person, we're looking at the environment that they're in, and then we're looking at the jobs or tasks that they want to do. So all three of those things interact really well together. And we're kind of helping, helping facilitate participation. So helping people become more engaged in those things that they gotcha. need and want so to So you can, you'll cover a lot of, sounds like a lot of basic life skills and things of that nature. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's very general and broad in the sense that everybody has things that they do in their life. Everybody has jobs that they do. Um, but everybody has slightly different ways of doing those things. So we all make, you know, many of us make breakfast in the morning, but we all make make different kinds of breakfast or we do it. uh, We have different appliances that we make the breakfast with. We shop at different stores. Um, It also encompasses a bunch of different cultures as well. So I think um, even it's almost like having a really unique perspective or looking at everything that might seem mundane or, mm-hmm. or, um, or generic and putting a very individualized spin on it. So how does this person go about their day and how can we help them accomplish the things that they want and need to do? Gotcha. So I'm sure you get the question a lot. Uh, what's the difference between occupational therapy and physical therapy? So could you elaborate just a little more on that too? Yeah, this is a hot topic with, with OTs and PTs, I think because as OTs, um, I I venture to say that it's kind of a running joke with, you know, OTs don't like to hear that, uh, oh, so you're kind of like PT, right? 
Um, and I have so much respect for my physical therapy colleagues, um, but I do want to make sure we're kind of advocating for our profession as a, as a unique entity. We do work with PTs. We work with speech language pathologists and physicians. Um, so the interdisciplinary aspect of it is really cool, but we are very distinctly different than physical therapy um, because we're looking at occupations and participation. Um, physical therapy, um, they might be looking more at the biomechanical aspects of somebody's uh, physical function. So if you think of balance, muscle strength, um, um, let's see, balance, muscle strength, endurance, um, gait, or uh, otherwise known as walking. So like looking at gait patterns. And a lot of times they're, they're trying to help fix those pieces of okay. the whole. Whereas OT might be looking at how are these things affecting your, your function or your everyday tasks? So okay. a physical therapist might say, you know, I'm, I'm going to go from the hospital setting because that's mostly where I work. Um, mm -hmm. Physical therapist might work with somebody in the parallel bars, uh, which is, you know, a device that can help somebody walk uh, and, and have a little bit more support while they're walking. And physical therapy might be gait training, helping somebody walk better, more efficiently, um, have better like reciprocal patterns um, and working on strength and balance. Whereas occupational therapy might say, okay, how is that going to look when you walk to the bathroom? Maybe okay. we should practice that. Um, what kind of things do you want to do or do you need to do that require walking? Okay. How does this integrate into everyday tasks. So we kind of take it, I don't want to say one step further, we're just looking at it in a slightly different way. And okay. also, I think we're not always going from a remediation standpoint. So it's not necessarily that we're trying to fix. It might be that somebody has uh, a chronic condition or a new condition like a complete spinal cord injury that still needs to be able to do those things in their life, despite the fact that they're going to have to do it differently now. So we're helping people do okay. things differently, but still accomplish the things they need and want to do. Gotcha. So there is a little crossover. Oh, definitely. Definitely. And I think it's impossible not to. If you're working with the human body and human beings, there's going to be crossover. And I think that's a good thing in a way. I think where people get, um, I guess it, it turns into a slightly contentious issue is when, you know, OTs kind of lose their professional identity and want to do things like, you know, weights and um, like, working with pegs or cones or non-functional objects if the person didn't do that before their injury um, or they're not interested in that. So it's very important to get kind of what we call a, a, a profile of somebody's interests and routines and roles and habits and all of that stuff. It's how are we going to help you in your life right now, whether that's doing things differently or helping you get back to the things that you did um, exactly how you want to do it. We're kind of... Uh, professional problem solvers too, helping people figure out how to manage their condition as well. Cause we're not going to be with them forever. Right. Um, yeah. or many times, you know, if you're working with adults, it's unlikely that you're going to be, you know, I see my patients for a few weeks and then they're usually either going home or to another level of care. So okay. I want to help them with the skills that they need so that they can continue the progress on their own. Okay, so when you say going to another level of care, so you were saying you're primarily in the inpatient setting. Can you just kind of explain to us a little more some of those differences of yeah, the inpatient, the outpatient, things like that for us? Yeah, so I guess I'll give it. Uh, I'll give an example in the context of like um, an adult who has had a stroke. Um, typically if you have a stroke, you are going to go to the, if it's serious enough, you're going to be going to the hospital or an emergency department and you'll likely be not all the time, but likely be admitted as, uh, as an acute inpatient, meaning you're in the hospital, um, doctors are monitoring your medical status and you're getting nursing care. You're likely being seen by therapists, um, 
the next level of care is inpatient rehabilitation. So for whatever reason, uh, the team feels like you're going to need more therapy to go home safely or go to the next level of care safely. So you might be in the hospital for a few days, a couple weeks. Again, everybody's different, so it just depends. Um, but for whatever reason, if you aren't able to go home or go to where you were living mm -hmm. um, before the hospitalization, you might enter another program called inpatient okay. rehabilitation, which is a lot of times it can be in the hospital itself, or it might be a freestanding facility um, on its own. So okay. um, like Michigan Medicine or U of M uh, in Ann Arbor, they're a hospital, but there's an inpatient rehab department in the hospital, whereas the Rehab Institute of Michigan, RIM, is its own freestanding rehabilitation setting. Okay. So, so if you need more, basically you go if you need more, um, more rehab to help okay. get to where you need to go. So in that inpatient setting, then, are people medically stable? So typically, yeah. Somebody is medically stable, um, but they still have doctors and nurses on hand just in case. So then where does outpatient kind of come into the role then? Well, I'll, I'll try and simplify it because it, it does vary from person to person. So okay. um, when I say a scenario, it may not be, you know, for anybody listening, it might not be what you've gone through or what, what you've experienced. But mm -hmm. um, let's say, you know, the person who has had a stroke um, goes through the rehabilitation program um, they get to the point where they're able to, to discharge home now, maybe with support from family, maybe independently, but either way, they're going to go home and maybe they have more things that they want to work on, you know, as, as occupational therapists in a hospital setting, oftentimes we're, we're helping people with, um, like basic self-care. So being able to dress yourself, being able to use the bathroom, um, being able to take a shower. Um, sometimes we'll get, we'll get into more of the complex things like managing the home, um, preparing meals, um, managing medications, things like that. But oftentimes the job isn't done or like the, the progress isn't over when they okay. leave inpatient rehab. So in that case, we might refer them to outpatient, meaning the person still is living or staying, you know, uh, where they sleep every night, but they're going to, you know, uh, an outpatient clinic. Sometimes it's in a hospital. A lot of times it's just in the community. So it's almost like going to a doctor's appointment. Um, but in this case, you're going to be going to see a team of therapists, um, a few times a week, maybe for a few hours each visit, um, and you're continuing to work toward those goals. So um, I'm kind of a small piece of the pie when it comes to uh, a person's rehab program. And usually mm -hmm. when people leave us, there's still a lot more progress to be made. So, so it, it, it continues even after outpatient. Um, and I think that the biggest thing is empowering people to to know about their condition, um, to know how they personally can succeed, um, and to help people be really goal oriented and 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 help them with some of those problem solving skills for a very, in my case, a very new condition, maybe that they haven't had before. It might be a spinal cord injury. Um, so there's a, almost a whole new culture to learn about and a new way of doing things. Cool. So today we're going to talk a little bit about pressure relief and pressure injuries, which is a pretty relevant topic. Uh, there's some conditions that you would think it was, it was more obvious, and then there's others that aren't so obvious. So Libby, could you just kind of tell us a little bit more about um, what medical conditions usually end up having to deal more with the pressure injuries and, and things of that nature? Yeah. So when when we talk about pressure injuries, just to give a little working definition, um, some of you listening might already be familiar with this. Maybe you know somebody who's had one or you've had one yourself. Um, but just to give uh, just a quick intro to like what is a pressure in mm -hmm. injury, um, a pressure injury can be a sore 
or an ulcer, an open area, or it could just be some sort of localized damage to the skin and the tissue underneath. Um, and that usually is due to putting pressure on something for a long period of time. So like a body part um, sitting yeah. or laying in bed. Okay. Um, and it's any sort of localized injury. It doesn't necessarily have to be an open area. You know, um, a very early pressure injury is just a red area. Maybe that doesn't um, blanch, you know, when you put your finger on it, it stays red. Um, whereas a stage two or next level would be, you know, an open area. So if you think of like scraping your knee, that would be an open area getting into kind of this ulcer area. Okay. But um, pressure injuries are pretty, um, they're, they're something that we want to prevent. And I think if we can offer any advice um, in this podcast of how to prevent those and how to how to promote healing if you have one. Mm. This is relevant to anybody who is a wheelchair user. So maybe somebody with a spinal cord injury or somebody who's had a stroke. Um, it could also be for anybody who is at risk of not moving for a, uh, an extended period of time. So sure. perhaps um, somebody with um, like later stage Alzheimer's, or dementia who might not be initiating um, movement often. Um, it could be somebody who has Parkinson's disease. Sometimes getting movement started is difficult for people with Parkinson's. So they might not be moving. They might be sitting for prolonged periods of time or laying down. Um, people with um, decreased sensation. So they're not able to feel um, where they might be putting pressure for a long period of time. So. You know, my first, you know, people might think of spinal cord injury right away. If, you know, you've got paraplegia and you're not able to feel uh, legs, um, your bottom, hips, things like that. But also folks that have um, diabetes, many times you have something called peripheral neuropathy, which means you have decreased sensation maybe to your feet or your hands. Um and so you might not feel if you're putting too much pressure on something, or you might not feel if you're walking and over uneven surfaces or even walking on an object. Um, and our body has pain responses, so it can tell us to take pressure off, right? So pain is a good thing, a, you know, because it's telling us, hey, you know, you shouldn't be putting pressure here or something needs to change. You need to move your body and shift. And if you don't have the sensation um, to give you that message, you might you might be on you might be sitting on something or standing on something or leaning against an object that's causing um, that can cause skin breakdown over time. So it might be cutting off the blood flow um, and causing this this ulcer or the sore that develops from this prolonged pressure. Um, or if you are an older adult. Um, so somebody over the age of 65, your skin, our skin loses elasticity and thickness over time. And we're more susceptible to what's something called uh, shearing. So twisting, pulling um, of the skin, it could be on anything, but your skin tends to get more fragile as you age. And that's just an inevitability of aging. It doesn't mean that you're going to get a pressure injury, but it does mean you're more susceptible and you're at higher risk. Um, so, so there are more than there are more factors that can contribute to a pressure injury than just pressure then is what you're saying. Yes. I mean, pressure is the mechanism typically. So it right. could be pressure by shearing or it could be just prolonged pressure or intense pressure. But the risk factors for those things um, uh, are, are really broad. So it could be skin integrity. It could be circulation. It could be um, sensation or it could be immobility. So not moving for a long period of time. Sure. Yeah. And, and like you mentioned, the cognitive factor is, is huge with people um, with dementia. I know myself when I worked in home care, I would see several people in assisted living facility and they would just for most of the day, just sit on a recliner chair and I guess forget to move. And yeah. or they were safe to get up. So 
a lot of times you have that factor that comes into play as well, where the person just doesn't remember to either get up or shift or just isn't safe. So, um, yeah, and, risk and, factor if, I can think of too, so. and it's, it's one of those things that, you know, you and I don't, we, as humans, we don't usually have to think about shifting our weight. It's kind of an unconscious thing. Um, yeah. so if you've got somebody who's, you know, um, has dementia and maybe is not able to ask for help with moving around. Um, I know a lot of people that, um, or with Parkinson's, my uncle has Parkinson's. And um, so, so I've learned a little bit more about it um, through mm -hmm. that. But um, if somebody needs assistance moving or, you know, maybe the initiation piece, so actually getting up, they need just a reminder. Um, if somebody's not doing that on their own, then they're at higher risk. If somebody's not saying, hey, I noticed you've been sitting there for a couple hours, maybe we should shift position. Or do you need help standing up? Or do you need help sure. shifting your weight? Um, it, there, there's a lot of things that play into that. Um, sure. And there, there's a lot of... Um, Again, there's a lot of there's a lot of factors that can can contribute to pressure injuries, which is why it's such an important issue. I think because it's not just caused from one condition or one type of one behavior or or one habit. There's a lot of things that play into it, which is kind of what occupational therapy looks at too. It's looking at there's a lot of person factors, there's a lot of things in the environment, um, mm -hmm. and then there's also a lot of tasks or things that you can do to either prevent it or make it worse okay and just going back to the the staging you'd kind of explained um some of the earlier stages so to say like you said stage one sound more like a blister and then stage two is when that blister kind of pops what what kind of happens where are these other stages after that sounds like it just as the as it gets a higher stage the wound is just worse is what i'm guessing yeah, a higher stage, they typically go up to stage four. So you've got stage one, two, three, and four. There's also something called unstageable injuries, okay. um, which is when it's it's difficult to tell the extent of the damage. Um, so a stage one, and this is why I try not to say pressure ulcers, because a stage one injury is technically not an open area. It's just a red area that either or a discoloration that doesn't um you know if you put your finger if you press your finger into your skin you kind of see the color come back or the blood flow is coming back um like a stage one pressure injury is something that's not open but it's red it's red where it's not supposed to be um it may even have a temperature change maybe hot so sometimes okay. in rehab we'll call them like hot spots okay so, it doesn't necessarily have to be caused from sitting down or not moving for a long time. Mm -hmm. It could be, you know, if we're making a lot of times OTs will make people splints um, to either help with functional positioning of the hand. And if we're doing a custom splint, that means it's going to sit really closely to the person's skin. So we might be checking the skin for what we call hot spots. So pressure where this device has kind of put pressure on the skin, especially over like the bony area. So okay. um, especially like well, the bony spot on your wrist is a high risk area for sure. pressure injuries. So we're checking that skin, you know, every few hours to make sure that there's no hot spots because hot spots mm -hmm. can lead to open areas, which is stage two. Sure. A so stage it's kind of like a, you, I think I'd kind of say a stage one is almost like a warning sign. Your body kind of yeah. saying, hey, something needs to change here or else this could escalate rapidly. Yes. And, you know, we've all, we've all, you know, sat, you know, with pressure on an area for a long period of time. I think of, um, you know, putting my hand on my chin, I might get a red spot yeah. there, but it usually goes away. Right. Yeah. Or if I'm, I'm reading and I've got my hands into my forehead, I might have a little red area, but it goes away. Mm -hmm. A stage one wouldn't go away. Okay. And it's a warning sign because something needs to change or some something needs to shift. Um, because for whatever reason, the the blood flow is not is is not um circulating 
okay. uh, in that area. So you've got, it, it. it's like your body's warning sign. You're exactly right. Gotcha. So then you said stage two, it's, it's as if that layer has popped open. How far, yeah, so how far down has that gone into the skin, I guess? Um, it's usually just, you know, you've got a couple layers of skin. So you might see, you might have some exposed layers of skin underneath like your, your mm -hmm. top layer. Um, okay. This is, you know, I, I think of this as like a skin tear or it could be, you know, from a burn, but you're not getting into like muscle and bone and things like that. It's, it's okay. I think about it like a, a knee scrape, falling off a bike, things like that. Mm -hmm. Again, a popped blister is another example. Okay. Um, and again, the higher the stage, the worse, worse sure. off you are, or the, or the worse, the more severe the injury is. So what, what's going on with stage three and four then? And, so, and I guess the other stage, question is, when does it really start getting serious? Like somebody should get medical attention. I would say personally, I would be telling your doctor if I had um, anything and any kind. So stage one, even if you're seeing okay. hot spots, um, then that's something that that's your warning sign right there. I'm not, I wouldn't say you need to seek, like, it's not like a call 911 type of thing, but um, it's something I would be bringing up to your primary care physician or your therapist. Okay. Um, and that's why I think skin checks are so important. So people uh, having a routine where you're checking your skin every single day mm -hmm. to uh, kind of assess the area, right? Um, versus, you know, in the hospital, a lot of the times um, nursing or therapy is going to help check your skin. So I help check people's skin when I'm maybe helping somebody complete bathing or take a shower. Um but the end goal would be for them to be able to check their own skin okay. because you know your body best out of anybody. So I want people to feel like they have some, some agency or some, mm -hmm. you know, taking it upon themselves to advocate for their own bodies and say, hey, this doesn't look right. Um, so I would say as soon as you're seeing any redness that doesn't go away after a few hours, um, I would be, I would probably take a picture of it. Mm. Um, I, I think, you know, phones are, <laughs> phones, are, having smartphones can be really helpful in certain, in certain ways. Um, in, in the sense of you've got a camera on there so you can show the doctor, it's got a timestamp on there so you can take pictures over time um, and see how it either progresses or disappears. But yeah. If you have an open area, that's, and again, we all get cuts, we all get scrapes and things like that. That's a little slightly different than like a pressure injury um, because, um, you know, a pressure injury is something that it's typically related to something positional. So if you were to continue to do, you know, if I bump my elbow, I'd like to think that I'm going to avoid that next time. I'm not going to be continuously bumping my elbow over and over and over again, or putting pressure on that spot for hours at a time. But pressure injuries can be a little different um, where if you're sleeping in one position all night and in the morning, you're noticing when you're looking in the mirror that um, you've got a, a really red spot that's not getting better over time. Mm -hmm. That's going to indicate something, some sort of, habit that's going to have to change, whether it's positional um, or whether it's something related to the type of mattress you have. Okay. So stage three, can you mm -hmm. just that's, explain a little bit more? Yeah. So I'm sure nursing, uh, somebody who's a nurse or a physician might be able to explain this a little better. Yeah. Um, but it, Stage three is getting worse. So you've got um, oftentimes fat is visible through the ulcer um, and you might have something called like slough or Eshkar, which is kind of like, um, I don't know, uh, kind of like extra tissue around. Okay. Uh, you might see a little bit of what we call tunneling. So it kind of, uh, it's getting deeper. Okay. Um, Fascia, or sorry, uh, like muscle and tendons and ligaments and bone are 
might not be exposed, like isn't exposed yet. Mm. Um, but it's, it's getting worse. It's more than just a, a skin tear or the first few layers of skin. You're getting deeper now. Okay. And then stage four is when you've got, I mean, this is, this is the worst one. So you may have exposed muscle, tendon, or bone. Um, the depth or how deep it is kind of varies depending on where it is. Right. Um, but this is, this is pretty serious now. Um, they're all serious. I think, I th again, any open area, especially, um, especially one that's going to have continued pressure on it you have an increased risk of infection because it's an open area. So if it's not being okay. attended to, um, mm -hmm. then, then it's something that requires pretty quick attention. Okay. So with the pressure injury stages, at what stage is a person normally hospitalized and when, is it, when can it normally be managed at home, like from the outpatient setting or whatever? To be honest, that's a good question. Um, oftentimes, it's not necessarily an emergency like a, mm -hmm. um, a traumatic spinal cord injury or a stroke or something like that. Um, but if the wound were to get infected um, and you were to go to your follow-up appointment with either a doctor or a therapist, um, and it and if it was something that went beyond what you could manage at home. So they're going to have nursing involved to say, okay, um, we're going to do different dressing changes. We're going to bandage it. We're going to clean the wound and we're mm -hmm. going to watch it and monitor it. If it's something that's starting to get, um, I would say, out of control. So if it's starting to get infected, um, mm -hmm. or maybe the person, ag again, it really just depends okay. on, on the type, but, um, sometimes again, infection, you can have like yellowing or even, um, blackening of the area. So you're starting to get, you know, I am thinking of a few folks that have worked with that, have had peripheral artery disease or diabetes, and they've got a wound on, you know, their toe or their heel that's not healing, and mm -hmm. it's getting either infected or, or if the blood flow is cut off for long enough, the cell, the skin cells can die, and then you might end up with kind of a blackened area, and with that comes other risks of gangrene, um, uh, infections that can spread to different parts of your body. And that's when it's, that's when it would be a real emergency. And that's when sometimes people have, you know, they need to have a portion of their body amputated. Okay. Um, so that's when it becomes an emergency. Before that, it's kind of hard to say, it depends on the support the person has at home. So if it's a caregiver that that's noticing this and bringing this to the doctor's attention. The doctor might, you know, give some recommendations. Nursing might send them home with bandages, or they're giving them medication to manage it at home. Okay. Um, and typically, this is something that requires like constant monitoring to figure out: yeah. is this getting to a point where, um, where it's getting infected? And I would say usually like yellowing, um, or a wound that's just not healing. If okay. you've had something for weeks and it's not changing at all, that would be a reason, not necessarily go, going to the emergency room, but it would be something that you would want to bring up with your doctor the next time you yeah. see them. So in other words, basically you're saying to pay close attention because it can be a serious and if not dangerous and deadly situation. Yeah, it can, it can get deadly. It can get very serious. And so I think a, uh, a big take home message for this would be to always be monitoring your own skin or the skin of a loved one. Um, keep in mind that even a stage one is something serious, even though, even if it doesn't need immediate medical attention, it's mm -hmm. your warning sign that something isn't, that something needs to change. Okay. And then in general, is there, for the stages, like a certain time frame, you usually see to, um, for it to heal up. 
That would be a good question for uh, probably nursing. I don't do as much with like the wound healing, but I know some really great um, wound care nurses um, and physicians. And there are some therapists that um, might get involved with the wound healing. Okay. Um, but I will say that um, with pressure injuries, these wounds tend to take longer to heal especially if it's what I call like an inevitable pressure. So we all sit down, right? And if sitting down is causing pressure on like your tailbone or your sit bones, you know, the two bony areas underneath each butt cheek, um, if you're sitting on that every day um, and it's inevitable, you're going to be in a wheelchair for the day or you're going to be in a recliner chair or in bed, um, it's going to be harder to heal that wound because you're putting pressure on it every day. And um, I think I think it's important to know that, you know, people who are walking or standing, they're taking pressure off. But somebody who's a wheelchair user may not have the opportunity or may not be able to take pressure off by walking, right? So they've got to find other ways to do it um, in order to get blood flow to that area. Because what happens is the blood flow, again, gets cut off, so the wound isn't able to heal. Um, so even if it's something that happened from, you know, you're scooting over from the wheelchair to the bed, and maybe you nick your skin on the wheel or an armrest or something like that, um, which is a little different than a pressure injury. It's still going to take some time to heal because you need blood flow to the area, but it's not quite as bad as like prolonged pressure causing decreased blood flow. So you, the blood can't get to the nutrient or to the to your skin cells. Mm -hmm. um, so so you're getting this gradual breakdown. Gotcha. And then you mentioned earlier on that there are certain areas of the body that are more susceptible. Can you yeah. So. Some bony areas, areas. um and or, if you're listening right now you can find some of those bony areas right now um again your wrist isn't a spot that's gonna get uh isn't at a super high risk of a pressure injury unless you're wearing like a splint but it's a good one to find first so i have a really bony wrist yeah. um and you can feel it with your own with your hand mm -hmm. um other bony areas if you start you know at the top of the head you've got the back of your head, believe it or not, that kind of um, what we call the occiput, but it's okay. the back of your head. If, if you think of somebody who is in the hospital and lying in one position over time, that's not getting any blood flow to that, mm -hmm. that part of the head um, and it doesn't allow any sort of wounds to heal and it can eventually cause, cause skin breakdown over time. You've got your shoulders. Again, this is if you were lying down got your okay. shoulder blade um, along your spine or where bony areas are, um, your tailbone, um, your hips, and then your heels when you're laying okay. down. Now, when you're sitting up, you've got your side hips, um, you've got like the sides of your knees, and you've got your ankles. So it really depends on where... Um, where you're positioned but yeah okay. any bony, elbows can be problematic if you're sitting up in a chair and you're resting your arms on your armrests so um yeah there's unfortunately there's a lot of places that uh at, are at a higher risk of skin breakdown or pressure injuries but yeah think of the bony areas um okay so <clears throat> kind of moving on you you said prevention is key mm -hmm. and I think we know that because obviously if somebody gets a sore you know, you're in the hospital. So not only is it impacting a person's uh, health and well-being, but it's also a financial, a financial impact as well. Um, I, I'm just looking at some statistics here that even when, when a person gets a wound, if they rego surgery, this is with the SCI population. There's one study that reported there's a 41 to 47% chance of recurrence rate. Um, I'm seeing that there's actually a fairly high, a moderately high, I should say, mortality rate for elderly. So can you kind of talk a little bit about some keys for prevention, what we should be looking at, what we should do 
Um, I think in this scenario, definitely being proactive is, is the key, like you were saying. So, yeah, I think, um, I think prevention is, is like the number one thing because Mm -hmm. it's, you know, once you have an injury, of course it's possible to heal it and resolve it. So it's not like there's, you know, there's still, there's still ways to remediate that, but if you can prevent it from happening, um, that's going to be, that's going to be your key there. And sometimes it's inevitable. Sometimes it's, it's just, um, how your body is responding to pressure. Mm -hmm. As we get older, um, we are at higher risk. Um, even, you know, they've done studies where, um, people haven't, people with spinal cord injury, haven't had a pressure injury for 20 years. And all of a sudden they get one. Okay. So it's not necessarily like, um, there's a lot of things you can do proactively, but sometimes they just happen. Um, but there are things I think, um, you know, as OTs, we talk a lot about, or we help people, um, we help people get back into familiar routines or we help them get back into routines with some changes. So depending on what kind of condition they have or what their life looks like right now. So for, for prevention, the biggest, you know, from an OT standpoint, we're getting into skincare checks, daily skincare checks, um, whether that's with a mirror um, or, you know, I, I, we give people long mirrors that have, you know, it's a long, almost like a selfie stick with a mirror on the end. Mm -hmm. So you can check your heels, you can check your backside, um, you can check areas that are harder to see. But I would even think that if you use a selfie stick with your actual phone and had your camera setting, you might be able to, you probably be another way to do it as well. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's looking in the hard to reach areas with mirrors. It's also um, finding times where you're going to be able to inspect your whole body, right? So I, you know, with folks who have spinal cord injury or caregivers of people who have, you know, many different health conditions, we want to work into your routine. So it's going to be something that doesn't take a lot of extra work. So the first thing that comes to mind is before and after a shower, right? The clothes are coming up anyway so you're going to have access visual access to the whole body um using the bathroom can sometimes be a good time to do it um when you're changing clothes again from nighttime to daytime finding finding times of the day that is going to work for that person to check and then establishing a time um a lot of times it's it's not enough just to say like okay make sure you check your skin once a day Mm -hmm. it might be what time are you going to do it tomorrow? It's setting an action plan for, okay, tomorrow, you know, or if I take showers at night, um, when I get undressed, I'm going to check my whole body. I'm going to be in front of the bathroom mirror. Um, and when I'm in the shower, I'm going to be leaning side to side, checking my body there. Mm -hmm. Um, I do think it's easier. Um, and this is just anecdotally, it, it seems to be easier for caregivers to check because it's easier to get like a bird's eye view of the person's whole body. Um, yeah. And it's easier if the person has sensation. So if you're able to feel something and say, oh, this is sore right here and take a look versus somebody who doesn't have sensation, you know, in their legs or their bottom, it's going to be harder to notice that stuff. So no matter what the issue is or what, what, puts you at a higher risk of pressure injuries, checking every day is going to be really, really important, especially in those bony areas. So back of the head, again, you might be putting a mirror back there to check things out, elbows, shoulders, shoulder blades, spine, knees, tailbone, hips, heels, toes, those kind of things. Um, but I think it's very important to find a time and to have a plan. The brain likes routine. So if the brain, you know, we all crave it, uh, you know, neurologically, we like having a routine down and it helps us stick to things. So having a designated time that you're going to do this and ideally something that works with your routine already. Okay. So, so 
doing skin checks. Um, what else? I'm assuming repositioning is probably another important thing for people to do. Yes. So you've got your skin checks. Um, that's more of a uh, kind of just a monitoring technique, but then you've also got pressure relief to allow blood flow to get to the areas that have, you know, prolonged pressure. So there's the, there's, it really depends on your own situation. Um, but there's a, a, a lot of resources out there that show different types of pressure relief. Um, and you may have been told by a therapist or your doctor shown how to do these. Um, but there's a lot of different, different ways to relieve pressure. And oftentimes it's, you know, every 15 minutes or every half hour, you're taking pressure off the area and either shifting your weight or doing something, uh, changing position, changing location. Um, it's anything that takes pressure off the area for at least more than a minute. Okay. Um, and so how, how often should somebody uh, reposition? Is it kind of based on their risk or is there a general rule of thumb? Um, so I've heard different things. Um, so if, you know, go with what your healthcare provider is telling you. However, mm -hmm. If you're from a wheelchair level, so if you're sitting in a wheelchair during the day, we have been told um, when I worked at a rehab hospital in Chicago, every 30 minutes, you should be taking a two minute pressure relief break. This tends to be, again, individualized. So if you're somebody who has a power wheelchair and it has a tilt function, mm -hmm. pressure relief tends to be a little easier to take that two minute break. You just recline yourself all the way backwards and hang out for a couple minutes, taking pressure off that area. Um, however, if you're somebody who likes to do what we call a wheelchair push-up, so pushing through your hands to take pressure off, mm -hmm. you might not be able to do that for two minutes straight. So in that case, I would say every 15 minutes trying to do it for a one minute time period. Okay. Um, but usually within that 30 minutes, some sort of shift in weight should happen. Um, Ideally, the longer, the better. So if you can take the pressure off for the full two minutes, that's going to be the better bet. Um, in bed, this is where it gets a little different because, of course, you want um, you want to be able to sleep. Uh, so taking every 30 minutes, taking a two minute pressure break is not super feasible. Um, especially if you want to have good quality sleep. So many times it's, um, it depends on the person. It could be once every few hours. Um, it could be that you're looking into mattresses or pressure relieving, um, beds that, that are going to do it for you. Um, mm -hmm. so that you don't have to set a timer and wake up throughout the evening to throughout the night to, to take pressure off. So that's where the environment comes in. So getting, um, mattresses, sleeping surfaces that are going to take that pressure off for you. Um, or they have pillows, they have padding, anything that's going to, again, take pressure off the bony areas that you might be laying on for a long period of time. Okay. And compliance, do you, do you normally experience issues with patients not following through with those routines? And if so, is there any, do you have any tips on how to help people become more compliant with that, the weight shifting and? I think it's kind of, um, it needs to be collaborative between the, the person doing the pressure relief and the healthcare provider. Because if I were telling somebody, or if I noticed that somebody wasn't doing their pressure reliefs on time, or they were consistently not, you know, initiating those breaks, I might wonder if they're, if I need to do something differently um, on my end to, to see like, how can we make this work for you and your life? So I'd probably get into like their daily routine. And if there's somebody who uses their phone a lot, it might be, um, suggesting or trying out some different reminder apps on their phone. Okay. Um, to everybody has a different way that they keep their habits or keep these routines, but I think repetition is really important. And a lot of times that repetition starts in the inpatient rehab setting or in the hospital setting. Mm -hmm. So for a while, we might be the person 
or I might be the person that's saying, I'm keeping the time and saying, okay, we're going to do a pressure relief for two minutes now and we're hanging out there. But during that time, we might be talking about pressure relief strategies. And the goal would be for the person to be able to do it on their own or be able to direct their care on their own. Now, if the person is not able to, um, let's say memory is an issue or there's something with the thinking skills going on, um, it's going to be up to the caregiver. Uh, the care provider to initiate those. So then we're going to be working directly with the caregiver as well. But I would say it's about figuring out what each individual needs and how they're going to respond in the best way. Like my mom, if I were to give her an iPhone app, she would not know what to do with it. So I probably wouldn't go that route with her. I'd probably be going with um, either some sort of digital timer that just goes off and she has Mm -hmm. to kind of cancel it out, almost like an alarm. Mm -hmm. Um, or I might try and work it into her, you know, routine in some way, you know, doing the skin checks, um, during bathing, or maybe she loves to heat up her coffee in the microwave. So it'd be when that coffee is going, I want you to do some sort of pressure relief. So it's figuring out what's going to be the thing that helps you. Okay. You had, you had mentioned a few, we had mentioned apps. Are are there any particular apps that you know of or could recommend? Um, I've heard of a few. And I think this is where, um, if possible, Mm -hmm. getting on to, um, like for some of the maybe younger user, wheelchair users, getting on Instagram and finding um, groups or uh consumers or people that are going through similar scenarios. Like I know there's a lot of YouTube videos out there. There's a lot of Instagram handles of um, wheelchair users that have advice for pressure relief. Um, Mm -hmm. So um, the, the one I can think about right now, like there's a a girl named Chelsea Hill that had a spinal cord injury. She has paraplegia and she does a lot of, you know, fun videos. Like she, she works with like an adapted dancing program, but she also sometimes we'll do little tutorials about pressure relief. Um, So that's what I'll say first um, is find people that are going through similar situations if you can, because as a healthcare provider, I only know so much. I don't know your experience. And I think the sharing of ideas between people going through the actual thing is so important um, versus the doctor or somebody just saying, hey, you should be doing this. Um, I think it's good to talk to people that might be experiencing something similar, um, because everybody has different strategies and some of them might benefit you. Um, in terms of apps, there is, let's see, um, there's one, so there's one, um, called habit timer and it's 99 cents. Um, and you could, I believe there's even, if you just typed in pressure relief in the apps, Uh, section like the app store of your phone you might be able to find some um there's also things like palindrome timers um for uh like productivity so anything that you could set a timer i've also had people um set their alarms on their phone so every half hour it's going off and it might not be like that forever it might just be in the beginning. We're going to set an oh. alarm for every half hour. Your alarm is going to go off and there's mm-hmm. going to be a reminder that says pressure pressure break or pressure relief. Um, and it's not to say that's going to be like that forever. Um, the key is how do you get the habit to stick? How do you get okay. the routine to, to carry over from day to day? So that's, you know, the iPhone can be a really powerful thing in that sense. There's, again, typing in pressure relief in the app store, um, setting like setting physical alarms or or reminders on your phone or trying habit tracker. I've not tried that yet, um, mm-hmm. but but yeah, there's a lot out there. Okay. And so we we're talking a little bit about back to the weight shifting. We have some video of you demonstrating some of the techniques. So I'm gonna go ahead and load them up here yeah and i would say for you know for copyright reasons i can't really you know there's a lot of youtube videos out there 
if yeah. you were to type in pressure relief, I would I would encourage anybody watching this or listening to this to do some of their own research and check out what other people are doing as well. Um, so I'm showing a few different strategies that might work for you, but it would definitely be helpful if you're still seeing a therapist or working with a therapist to ask them, um, look up some videos on your own, ask your doctor if you're concerned. Um, I don't want anybody to feel like they're alone in this. So there's a lot of people doing these pressure relief strategies right now. So these are just some examples. So the first one, your the wheelchair push-up. Yeah, so this is a wheelchair push-up. And again, these, these strategies are not going to be for everyone, but they might work for you. Um, okay. This would be, I think, people who have um, full use of their upper body are gonna be able to do these probably the most effectively. So you lock your brakes, you put both arms on the wheels and you push up. I'm taking pressure off the tailbone and the sit bones. Okay. If you can hold it for two minutes, great. If you can't, I would say every 15 minutes, you're giving yourself a wheelchair push up and trying to hold it for as long as you can. Okay. Okay. Sure. So you said to lock the brakes. Now, if you're in a power chair, do you want to turn the chair off or what do you, is there anything else you have to do from that compared to the wheel, um, manual chair? Um, if you're in a power chair, I would say, yeah, probably turn the power off just in case your hand accidentally hits the joystick um, or the controller. You wouldn't want to kind of shoot forward. Um, same thing if you are reclining your chair all the way back. So I'm in a manual chair in this scenario, but if you have a power chair, oftentimes there's a tilt function. So you're tilting all the way back, almost as if, almost to where you're parallel with the ground, and then you're turning the chair off um, so that it doesn't get away from you. I've had a few, I've had a few moments where, um, where both of us forget to turn it off, and then it shoots out. And so it can, I'm sure, I, I would hope some people who are listening to this can relate to that. Um, the power chair is very powerful. So um, just, yeah, make sure you shut off uh, the chair before you start moving your hands around or uh, moving into different positions. The other thing I wanna say is when I'm put, doing a wheelchair push-up, it's really important that I'm not leaning forward too far because uh, as you can see, my feet are on the foot rests. Um, so ideally you could take the foot rests off and just have your feet resting on the ground. So when you're doing the push-up, your feet are resting on the ground. That I know that's not always an option for people. So if you're gonna leave the wheelchair, leg rest on, make sure you lean back enough so your center of gravity doesn't take you forward and potentially sure. flip the chair. Okay. So and that's one thing I would recommend. Okay, and it looks like you're doing some kind of a pressure relief there as well, or? Yeah, so that one's called like a forward or an anterior lean. And again, ideally you would take the foot rest off, lock your brakes, and then lean forward, almost like the thinking man pose. So that's taking pressure off the tailbone, and ideally you're taking pressure off the sit bones as well. Okay. Um, however, I know it's not always possible to take off the foot rest, so um, just being mindful of the fact that the farther forward you lean, the more, the higher risk you are of flipping the chair. So, um, all of these pressure relief strategies, I would highly recommend practicing with a therapist first, or at least a physician or medical professional watching, um, sure. so that they can step in or offer some suggestions. Typically, you know, when I'm when I'm teaching somebody about pressure relief or I'm helping them with it, I'm not just giving them a handout and saying, "Okay, go go ahead, practice this at home. Let me know how it goes." I'm usually working with them, watching, saying, "Maybe we should try it this way." We're picking the method that works for them. Okay. I think that's, that's the biggest thing is everybody's so different and everybody has different habits and routines and physical abilities. So it's important to, to, to really individualize everything. Okay. So this is a, uh, you're showing a side lean here. Yep. So that's, you know, again, a little bit better for like the sit bones, but lock your brakes lean to the side. Some people can kind of hook their arm or hold on 
to the side wheel while they're leaning. Okay. Again, don't practice this by yourself. Practice it with a medical professional supervising. Um, mm -hmm. Some people um, are able to do this. If you don't have the core strength, that might be a little more difficult. Um, but this is an option. Mm -hmm. um, when people are first learning this, oftentimes I'll have them do it um, next to a bed or a couch okay. or a flat, flat surface that's level with the chair so that gotcha. they can... Um, that was just what I was going to ask if you'd recommend being near like a surface that way, if anything does happen, it's there to kind of catch in. So you don't yes. have to in type. And, yep. and I think too, how you're talking about working with a medical professional, they'll be able to judge and tell where, where you're at functionally to let you know whether this is a safe method or not. Yes. Highly recommend, and this could be part of a therapy session. And a lot of times this is okay. part of a therapy session, especially for people who are going to be using a wheelchair for an extended period of time, because pressure is inevitable, right? You're going to be sitting. So how do you take pressure off when maybe walking isn't an option right now? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's important to to figure out with the therapist or the healthcare provider that you're with, and then practicing these things during your session. Okay. And one thing I will say is with those skin checks is that, you know, I think as therapists, we're all keeping an eye on pressure relief strategies, um, sure. especially for therapists who work with the um with the spinal cord injury survivor population, I think that's that's always kind of on the radar. However, uh, those skin checks, if you're starting to see hot spots or red areas and you're starting to get concerned, absolutely bring that up to your primary care provider or your therapist or someone so that they can address that and you can do some problem solving in the session. Um, and, and I think there's a sense sense of empowerment from knowing your body, knowing that, oh, this doesn't look right. Mm -hmm. I think I want to, I, I want to make sure I'm addressing this. So, so um, the, the best way to do that is to, is to check your body every single day um, in whatever way you can. Um, there's other small things too, like light, there's a lot of lifestyle changes. Yeah. I think, um, of course, you know, we're always going to promote healthy eating, things like that, but um, drinking water is really important for circulation and for healing, um, of tissues, um, exploring different positions. So if you're able to get on your stomach for, um, a period of time, mm -hmm. finding different positions so that you're not in one space all the time is going to okay. be, going to be key. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that if you're, you know, if you're smoking, that's going to delay healing as well, unfortunately. So, um, again, these are huge habit changes to make. So in no way am I saying that it's easy to all of a sudden stop smoking um, and adopt all these, these healthy lifestyle changes. But there's a lot of small things you can do. So even if it's drinking more water, um, adding in those skin checks. Um, making sure that your skin is clean and dry all the time. This is especially for like caregivers. Um, if somebody has had incontinence, so if there's urine on the skin, that tends to speed up skin breakdown. So making sure to check your loved one um, for damp skin or incontinence and, and kind of being vigilant about that. Sure. Yeah, moisture is bad. So I'm even thinking excessive sweating, making sure somebody's dressed appropriately for the season. Um, probably, probably fabrics too that of pants that people wear. You know, some materials are more likely to retain heat and make you sweat more. Things like that. Yeah, I mean, moisture is is usually not a good thing when it comes to pressure injuries or wound healing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm speaking very generally because wound care nursing professionals are going to know a lot more about this and about the kind of the sure. details of wet versus dry. 
But typically if you're sitting and you're sweating or you have a lot of moisture, whether it's from bodily fluids um, mm -hmm. or a spill of some sort, but you want to get that dried up quickly. After a shower, it's going to be important to dry as much as possible before you're putting on clothes or before you're going to be maybe helping somebody get back into a chair or helping yourself get back into your chair, um, keeping dry. Be gotcha. Huge. So how about, are there any other environmental things that people can look for? One thing I would think about is, you know, the type of chair that you have. Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes as people age, um, if they're somebody who's been a wheelchair user for a long time, um, you may you may notice that you don't fit in the chair as well, or the chair doesn't suit you as it you know as well as it did a decade ago. Um, some people will come to us um, from either a facility or from home, and they have a wheelchair that is too narrow for them, so they're getting yeah. their hip bones are rubbing against the armrests. Sure. And as therapists, we're always looking at the fit of the chair. We're looking how well is the person positioned in it. Um, are, is their skin rubbing against any areas that maybe it shouldn't? Because aside from like the parts of your body that need to be supported, like again, your butt and your upper thighs, potentially your back um, and your arms. Other than that, there shouldn't be things like rubbing necessarily. And then again, some people, if they need um, assistance for head control, it could be the back of your head that's being supported as well. But yeah. It shouldn't really be rubbing against the sides of your legs. Mm -hmm. um, and it shouldn't be kind of, uh, I've had a, a lot of people that either definitely look squished in the chair or it doesn't, uh -huh. um, it's not comfortable. It doesn't have a good cushion underneath and they might be slouching or yep. sliding down and putting kind of undue pressure on the spine or the tailbone. So, um, Find, sure. making sure your chair fits you right and if it correctly and if it doesn't if yeah. something even if something just doesn't feel right talking to your to your therapist or your primary care provider saying this doesn't feel right I'm worried about pressure injuries yeah I, th I think too you're talking about chairs being too small chairs being too large is another factor if it's not supporting you right and you feel like you're flopping or even if the chair is too high it could cause you to take a slouching posture and that's, as you know, no good for the, the sitting bones and it can cause excess yeah. pressure, even shearing and things like that. So, um, and it's, it's one of those things that like, trust your gut, like, you know, your body, um, you know, what feels right and what doesn't mm -hmm. and keep an eye out for hot spots. If you're getting red spots in areas that you haven't before, and you're not sure what the culprit is, um, it could be a wheelchair issue. And that's something to definitely bring up to a healthcare provider. Um, same thing with, you know, an, another thing that, um, especially as an OT in a hospital setting, I work with people a lot on, um, being able to use the bathroom and to get on and off the toilet. Um, but many times I'll recommend like a padded, um, frame or a padded seat for the toilet versus that hard porcelain or hard plastic. Um, especially if you're somebody who is going to need a a little more time on the toilet um it's important to be comfortable while, while you're there right and there's been a few times where i've you know i get worried about people being on the toilet for too long because it's on a hard surface so if you can find a way to mediate that whether it's getting a padded um a padded commode frame to go over top or a padded seat or it's taking a pressure break when you're leaning forward onto your knees while you're sitting on the toilet to take pressure off of that tailbone, I think is really helpful. So I know that sitting man or that like slouch, I'm trying the thinking man position is all like all like that comes to mind right now, but that's actually really good to take pressure off your tailbone while you're on the toilet. So do that. Um, and I would say don't sit on the toilet for longer than like 15 minutes. Um, again, I know that's not always possible and everybody has a different routine and, and, uh, way about doing things. So if you can get something padded underneath, underneath your bottom, that's going to be helpful too. Lately, I've been really, uh, I've been a really big fan of bidets for hygiene. Um, especially for, 
I would say caregivers that might be assisting their loved one with wiping after using the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think if you can find ways, because if you think about it, when you're wiping someone's bottom or between their legs, that's causing a shearing force. That's some sort of pressure. It's rubbing. Um, yeah. so toilet paper sometimes can be aggravating to the skin. Of course, I would never use a washcloth because that can be really scratchy. So sometimes I'll say, I'll recommend that people get like the wet wipes or something softer, mm -hmm. but even better still sometimes is if you can avoid some of the wiping or the excessive wiping in the first place. So bidets are much more affordable now than I think they used to be. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and they're usually... Yeah, a, just an attachment onto a toilet. So you don't usually have to get a whole new toilet. Um, but those can be really good for hygiene. That's not going to require excessive wiping. Um, so from from an OT standpoint, that's, you know, usually what we're getting into as well. Gotcha. So wrapping things up, we've covered a lot of content today. I was just curious if you had kind of a take home message, if there's, you know, any key, key points of wisdom that you know, that's the most important things for um, people to remember. Yeah. Um, so I would say number one is you are not alone. Many people have to are at high risk of pressure injuries, not just people who've had injuries. Um, uh, as you've heard, there's a, a, a huge percentage of the population that needs to do pressure relief. So if you're not in a, if you're in a remote area or not in an area where you're around a lot of people or not, um, not actively working with therapists, I would say, you know, get on YouTube, um, look on Instagram, find, find the community that can help you with this. Um, there's also a, a website. Um, again, each, if you have a condition that's, um, that's really prevalent in the U S there's a lot of organizations like the spinal cord. There's a lot of spinal cord associations and, um, resources that I think Jim is going to post or at least have available for people. Um, or like American diabetes association has a lot of tips for like, uh, prevention and things like that. But there's also, um, there's also a national pressure injury advisory panel and they have patient or client resources um, that you can check out. So check, check out, you know, I, I hope we can have some resources available for people who are listening to this so that mm -hmm. they can, uh, so that they can check them out. But most, a lot of times they're free, um, especially when it comes to different like pressure relief techniques and then talking to people, um, especially if you're, in and out patient setting, and there might be other other patients or clients there that you could ask. Um, ask your therapists um, if you're working with them. Um, no question is off limits for therapists, so please just ask whenever um, you know. Ask anything you need to 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 manage your health the best way you can, and to uh, and to live your life. Um, number two would be to check your skin often. So if you're not somebody who checks your skin every day or checks your loved one's skin every day, I would say set an action plan. So pick a time tomorrow or tonight that you're going to check your skin and think of all those bony areas. So like I said, back of the head, shoulders, shoulder blades, hips, tailbone, spine, heels, knees. Um, elbows, those areas. Check, check that somehow, and have a plan for how you're going to do it. Um, those mirrors can be helpful. Uh, um, again, uh, cameras or phone on the selfie sticks. That'd be, I think, a really creative way to do it. Um, but find a way to check your skin so you can get a baseline of what your body looks like right now and you'll be able to pick up if there's changes and and notice it and let people know so i feel like those are probably my two biggest ones and then um yeah every 30 minutes move or reposition if you can take pressure off an area for at least two minutes every 30 minutes um and again i know that's not always 
feasible. Uh, it's a pretty like blanket statement recommendation, but find a way to shift your weight every 30 minutes. If you can't do every 30 minutes for two minutes, do every 15 minutes for one minute. Okay. Well, great. Well, Libby, we appreciate you taking time to stop by and provide us some education on pressure injuries and how we can prevent them and you know conduct pressure reliefs. And as she mentioned, um, she's talked about a few resources, which we will um, post at the end of this presentation. And um, so you guys can have a you know, reference and, and find those easily as, as Libby mentioned. So again, thanks everyone for tuning in and watching this presentation. Bye. Hi, thanks.